Hospital Stell Washington. And then there is Advanced Cardiac Imaging Fellowship. Uh, in fact, uh, he was an inaugural fellow for an NHLBI multimodality uh, fellowship program, which was held conjun in conjunction with the, his appointment as a fellow also at MedStar Washington. Um, uh, Dr. Choi is uh, uh, known for his uh, work in uh, atherosclerosis imaging, um, and, and he's also known for his work in uh, coronary CT uh, imaging. Uh, he has been uh, a prolific um, uh, mentor to several trainees, and I found that he loves diversity, so over 50%, half of them have been female trainees. So he's, it's actually mentioned in his CV. So um, he is uh, uh, in multiple committees uh, in national societies. He's on multiple editorial uh, boards of several um, uh, journals, esteemed journals. And I browse through his uh, awards. Uh, no doubt he has been prolific and has, has been multiple young investigator awards and academic awards. But what I found was two awards which were worth mentioning. Number In 2012, he was the rising star of ACC. And then I was surprised in 2001, he was a Barry Manilow endowed prize in music. So obviously there is some musical touch, which I do not know about, I came to know uh, 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 and in 2021, he also had a Distinguished Service Award from ACC of uh, Maryland Chapter. He has over 80 uh, publications, several grants uh, and funding, uh, which are in cardiac imaging, plaque characterizing, uh, characterization and lipid lowering. And today we are uh, uh, going to be excited to see a journey uh, in an area of uh, real attention that is required, particularly here and elsewhere in the country on how coronary plaque characterization can lead to a journey towards better understanding of both coronary physiology and then understanding how we can prevent the uh, consequences of uh, a disease, which we, to be honest, have not had a much handle in a very long time. And probably we are just starting to understand the physiology and the biology much better. So. Andrew. Well, hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. You know, I think uh, sometimes when you hear your CV pre being presented, you're a little bit embarrassed because they ask, well, you know, you know, Dr. Choi, can you walk on water? And the answer is certainly no. And I'm also a little bit embarrassed because I think, um, you know, a lot of the work that we do is really underlied by the relationships that we have and what I've, you know, just be able to spend a little bit of time with uh, with uh, your uh, chair here and with some of the colleagues. It's really just a warmth of relationships. And I think that really un underlies what we're doing in cardiovascular medicine, what we're doing together as a field, and a lot of the collaborations that, uh, that we've been able to accomplish, you know, through artificial intelligence and that are happening here in this center of innovation really help are really underlied by kind of a mutual passion and i hope that we can share that together you know through this talk and so uh, let me uh, advance the slides uh, and i also recognize that through covid you know, having uh, in-person talks is something that's also novel. And at our institution in Washington, uh, we've had a lot of these hybrid talks. We've had uh, these virtual talks. And so I think it's great to be able to meet with you. And it was important for me to be able to come up and see you in person today, because I think it'll let us have some nice engagement and um, you know, encourage just a discussion uh, with our group today. And so um, we'll talk about uh, CT atherosclerosis imaging and AI as a vision for a brave new world. And if you read, if you uh, understand literature, Al Hook they wrote this book, Brave New World, you know, talking about, you know, dystopian society, you know, where may we, you know, where would society be with these advancements in technology? And um, there's a certain irony in that, uh, in that uh, book, in that literature, and what I hope to be able to help 
uh, uh, show you is how uh, this technology may not lead to a dystopian world, but hopefully a better world for us, you know, where we can really prevent heart disease. Uh, these are my disclosures, and we'll point them out as we go along. Um, a couple of simple objectives. Uh, first is to really be able to understand the principles of AI with emerging applications in cardiac imaging. Second is to demonstrate the evidence for AI and the CT uh, diagnostic accuracy to improve re reproducibility of stenosis. We want to survey what are the opportunities for us to enhance and rapidly allow for AI-guided atherosclerosis quantification, and what are some of the frontiers that we have available to us now through prevention and through AI. And so uh, if you've been following in uh, the lay uh, just literature and in the news, and you've got a lot of expertise here. And so I'm preaching to the choir. Um, Chat GPT has been what's been really in the news for the last couple of months. Um, not so great at solving complex cardiology cases, but it performs well in cardiovascular trivia. And I think we'll see some interesting data coming uh, in the imaging space as well uh, with the role of Chat GPT. Um, but a lot of the uh, headlines that you're reading, you know, does it show promise in assisting physicians? Will it beat doctors in compassion and quality of advice? I was very interested in this. And so you know, we were talking, you know, can it beat the Turing test? Um, can it beat um, what we have as clinicians to be able to offer and being able to, you know, give advice to patients and being able to speak to empathy, speak to the relationships that we're able to form with our patients. And that is kind of where the frontier of AI is at. And so maybe, you know, AI can beat the burnt out clinicians, the burnt out physicians that, um, that, are, that have come out of this COVID pandemic um, at our institution. You know, our trainees have just voted to unionize, and I think it's a response to what's happened through COVID. Uh, and I think uh, maybe this is one of the directions that will go. And in the Washington Post this month, the next level of AI is approaching. Our democracy isn't ready yet. And so maybe this has broader societal implications. Now, here at Rutgers and Robert Wood Johnson, um, you know, you are a national leader in artificial intelligence and cardiac imaging. Um, uh, uh, echocardiographic imaging and microscopic changes in how you're using radiomics to look at uh, texture mapping uh, for risk prediction. Um, uh, a new pathway to discovery with the private sector and a lot of the discussions today are the collaborations that are ongoing because a lot of this work is public and private uh, uh, partnerships. And also, you know, Dr. Sengupta and others that have been uh, really recruited here and how you're building trust in AI and what are the opportunities and challenges for cardiac imaging. You know, Dr. Sengupta being uh, the national leader in this space and really helping to set uh, the guidelines and standards like the prime checklist that I'll show you at the end. Um, to bring this from AI imaging to CT imaging, the field of CT imaging now has really evolved over the last two decades. And so on the left of this uh, figure shows you in 2006, you know, uh, the emergence of 64 detector row CT, uh, which is still a, a base standard um, for uh, atherosclerosis and CT imaging really coincided with some of the major advancements in the field. And so if you think of the COURAGE trial, thinking of stable patients undergoing uh, treatment for uh, uh, stable coronary disease, um, that uh, medical therapy is just as good as uh, intervention uh, when it comes to heart outcomes, although uh, there are symptomatic benefits um, with interventions. Um, as well as uh, new developments around education and competency in CT. Um, and as the field has evolved, um, the uh, FAME trials for uh, FFR, um, the guidelines have evolved as well, leading up to the 2021 ACCH chest pain guideline that now puts CT at a class one indication alongside our functional modalities. Uh, the future, uh, now that we have this establishment of the guidelines, are around advanced imaging modalities as well as machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so if we think about CT as a modality, um, it's not only about um, uh, image uh, enhancement, but also about image reconstruction um, around image acquisition, risk prediction on a, not only an individual level, but on a population level, and how um, stenosis evaluation, coronary flow assessment, and how these tools really look to give uh, the gift of time for clinicians, but also advanced uh, new practice. Um, and 
a lot of the why, you know, why do we need these new tools? Uh, we have a guideline now um, and the guideline writers, and I was one of the reviewers for this uh, uh, ACCHA chest pain guideline, and this is the opportunity to give uh, big uh, uh, congratulations and kudos to Martha Golati, to the chair, uh, Ron Blankstein, Leslie Shaw, and, and many others that had contributed this over four years of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and really is a revolutionary new paradigm and how do we implement this now in clinical practice. Um, three uh, major messages out of this guideline for around CT imaging. One, uh, an intermediate risk acute chest pain CT now achieving a class 1A recommendation that there are multiple randomized control trials showing evidence of benefit. Um, that uh, is class 1A or intermediate to high risk stable chest pain. And that I think importantly, the uh, paradigm of non-obstructive atherosclerosis um, uh, being important and this really being the first time in an ACCHA level guideline articulating that as a key aspect of uh, chest pain and CAD imaging. To bring this into a more practical level, you know, again, why, why are we thinking about this? Why do we think about artificial intelligence? So uh, you have uh, uh, in the left, Bill Clinton, in the middle, do you guys know who the middle figure is? Tim Russert, all right. Tim Russert was taking care of a cardiologist in Washington on K Street. And on the right is Rosie O'Donnell. And so um, Bill Clinton, a former US president died, uh, or not died, uh, had a heart attack at the age of 58 after having a normal stress test. Tim Russert died uh, also at age 58, had a normal stress test, um, but uh, had a heart attack and BF arrest and Rosie O'Donnell having a heart attack at the age of 50. And so all young individuals suffering from heart disease. Um, the paradigm of how we're thinking about uh, CAD has evolved in the last 30 years. And so 30 years ago, uh, we thought about now, how do we treat the end stage of disease? Um, uh, coronary stenosis is a focus of treatment um, and uh, disease detection um, because what we had also available uh, was, was uh, perfusion imaging and stress imaging. Uh, and as we have evolved now, now we're thinking about individual level patients. We're thinking about not only that end stage of disease, but subclinical disease and early atherosclerotic burden. Um, and how do we uh, really detect that and how do we prevent that? Um, from the American Heart Association, 20 to 40% of heart attacks are occurring in undiagnosed patients. And we've been focused on this tip of the pyramid. And this is an editorial on Jack with Aaron Mikos, uh, Johns Hopkins, right? So we've been focusing on treating disease, treating heart attacks, treating ACS, but it's only the tip of the pyramid. And how do we better address those patients that are at the mid and base of this pyramid and really thinking about prevention and how we incorporate that are not only our risk factors, which tell us part of the picture, but how we incorporate um, new methods of CAD imaging, new methods of atherosclerosis evaluation, new methods of, uh, of flow quantification, as well as integration of polygenic risk scoring, microRNA micro inflammatory bio, uh, biomarkers, and to really have this as a new model of prevention. Um, uh, you guys seen this uh, uh, picture before, right? So this is uh, what the peak of Mount Everest, right? And, and this is uh, when uh, when there's a small window of time each year and that one can go in to try to summit the peak. Uh, and this can this is what can happen is right there's a whole uh, uh, kind of a uh, rush to get up to the top and everybody gets stuck in the middle. And I think this is where the field is at right now in cardiac imaging and CT imaging. And so the evidence base is tremendous. It's Mount Everest. It's the best in the world. Um, but Access is limited in many places, and there are a lot of challenges. Um, you know, uh, you know cardiology, radiology collaborations may be one of the challenges. The training duration is long. For us to be able to meet demand right now, it's estimated that there are about 300,000 patients that are undergoing CT each year, um, but there are 20 million patients that have established coronary disease, and there are 100 million patients that are maybe at risk of having coronary disease. And it, it maybe it's going to take about 10 years for us to train an expert. So um, we don't have the capability, I think, to be able to train all the people that we need to be able to, uh, to, be able to offer uh, these approaches to people and to, the need to rapidly expand into the front line and also primary care clinic settings. And so um, perhaps we can fill this gap not only through expert readers, but also through artificial intelligence. And so this is a myth, right? Um, AI is going to replace all of us without enhancing cardiovascular care, and there's a fear of AI. Uh, well, 
you know, as you know here extremely well, that the, uh, there is this tremendous growth in healthcare data. It was estimated at Berkeley that it was 153 exabytes a year, um, you know, uh, well above uh, all of the words that have been ever spoken in humankind. Um, but that has really grown even to 2,300 uh, exabytes. And so the amount of information that we have available to us is overloading us. Um, how do we solve big problems? And you know, again, you know, here I think being really one of the leaders in the country and thinking about this, um, but around novel drug uh, therapy, disease, strat uh, disease stratification, integration of multi-omic data, and uh, physician uh, efficiency, how we're giving the gift of time, or you know, a question here, you know, optimized resource allocation, or how you might prevent uh, heart failure readmissions, um, and. On the right here is how uh, uh, some groups are using genomics to be able to predict statin response and non-response, and how you might be able to take um, uh, preventive therapies. We'll talk about at the end here beyond not, not just statin, but we've got um, multiple, multiple drugs that are available, ezetimibe, bemidogast, acid, PCSK9 inhibition, siRNA inhibition, and, and new drug therapies that are coming. And so how do we really allocate that to the people that need it in, in the right environments? Now, AI, as you know, it's any technique that enables computers to mimic human intelligence using logic, decision trees, and machine learning. Um, and so how do we use computers uh, to be able to mimic human intelligence? How do we use statistical techniques like deep learning and decision trees to be able to accomplish that? And how do we train machines to be able to perform tasks using uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks to be able to accomplish these tasks? Um, a part of everyday life, as you know well, uh, whether it's your Alexa at home, your uh, smartphone with facial recognition or self-driving cars are all already part of society, um, slowly uh, slower to integrate into medical practice. And we have to be the ones that validate that. And so, uh, again, um, uh, you know this, uh, I've seen this already, this is simple object recognition. Uh, and so how you train a machine to be able to look at different things within this video, whether it's a car, a person, a bus. Uh, and this principle is what makes it uh, uh, very feasible around, around cardiac imaging space. Now, we do have to manage our expectations and caveats. And this is a slide from Ed Nickel. Um, and thinking about, right, um, what are the things that AI are good at, but also what are the weaknesses? What are the biases that exist? And so if your data set doesn't fit what you're actually trying to do in the real world, then you may, uh, you may miss things. What's the methodological rigor that's uh, taking place? Is there you know, internal external validation? Is there a validation cohort that's showing you what you're doing? And does it reflect what you want to actually try to study? Um, there are commercial interests. Um, you have to be aware of fool's gold. There is a lot of uh, private investment and private equity investment that's going into these technologies. And you know they may have different goals than what you or I do. You or I are centered on the patient and trying to de deliver the best outcome for that patient. Um, but you know, company may have something else in mind. Um, and then we have to approach this technology with the same kind of scrutiny that we do you know, any kind of data, any kind of evidence that in cardiology, you know, cardiology is built on a foundation of randomized controlled trials, and we don't have that yet for these AI technologies. And it's up to the field to be able to prove that. We need to understand what's in the black box, and we don't want to solve problems that we don't have. And so, you know, the example is uh, you know, pleural fusion on a chest X-ray. Well, it's a nice uh, problem to try to solve, but is that something that we really need to try to solve? Because it's it's simple to do. You know, it may take you or I. You know, just a couple of seconds or a radiologist to be able a couple of seconds to read a chest x-ray. So we don't need the AI for that. We want the AI to solve things that, um, that we can't do ourselves uh, easily. This is an example of bias. And so and whether you underfit or overfit the model. And so on the left, uh, what do you have here? Right, it's uh, President Obama. Um, the um, model, and this is like a famous like Google example, right? The model didn't account for the fact that President Obama was a black man. And so when it reconstructed it, it got his features right, um, but it reconstructed him out as a white man instead. And so, um, and we can kind of think about this in any of the AI problems that we want to put together. And so, you know, another way to think about this is how you might put together this uh, bicycle um, where you have component pieces and you have to put each of the individual pieces together and train your AI to be able to build that model. And it's the same thing here. And so you may ask your AI a simple question, Right? Can you differentiate between calcium or non-calcium? And using the series of uh, convolutional networks um, across a 1,000 by 1,024 matrix, 
and then taking it down on a, uh, within that matrix, within a voxel and within a voxel into a pixel, um, being able to train that uh, model, uh, what's being seen so that you can answer a simple question of calcium or not uh, uh, calcium present, and then to build it back up until you uh, answer a question of not only that individual pixel level, but being able to look at what's happening in the image for structure segmentation, for um, coronary segmentation, for plaque, for plaque characterization, and then plaque quantification. And so um, now to get into uh, kind of where I think the field is at, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, what is it, you know, why do we need it? Um, and what is, you know, why do we need the AI and uh, in uh, CAD imaging and what is it? So my first take home point for you, AI can now allow for accurate and direct image assessment of CAD. What does that mean? So uh, the field uh, was initially uh, interested in risk prediction. How do you take uh, large databases, and this was from the confirmed registry of 25,000 patients, uh, images that were already read, put into a database, and you're using lo logistic regression to be able to predict you know, whether a patient would have an MI or not. And the idea is that this is what you or I do when we're at the bedside, is integrate all the experiences that we have to be able to tell a patient, you know, are you going to have a heart attack or not, and let me help you uh, do that treatment. And so now CB Alaraf, who's at Arkansas now, used XG Boost uh, using 25 risk factors and calcium scoring and showed that well, all right, a machine learning model um, could do better for risk prediction, but uh, the images were already interpreted. Um, where we um, then thought, uh, sought to ask is, um, well, uh, can we teach the machine to do that what we do already uh, uh, pretty well, or maybe even do better than that? Uh, this is from the PROMISE trial. So if you remember the PROMISE trial, 10,000 patients, uh, multi-center trial, uh, uh, randomized to anatomic imaging versus stress testing imaging. Um, well, uh, what Michael Liu did was to uh, evaluate how did the core lab do to uh, the readers that at the time, if you think back to 2009 when Promise was starting, most of those readers were level two readers. And as the field was nascent, the readers were also building their experience. What they found is that the core lab interpreted 41% less patients as having significant CAD, uh, meaning that um, uh, Forty percent of the time, the scans are being overcalled. Right, that you think that the real world readers were overcalling disease because maybe they didn't have the requisite experience, and so more experienced readers are more accurate than less experienced readers. Um, and so that led us to uh, you know, this first study, and this um, this was clinical validation of. Um, uh, and we think about uh, what are the right standards around imaging. How do you prove? that a new technology is as good as what you have or better. But well, we set up a paradigm of this, of uh, how do we establish uh, CT against expert readers? Uh, then uh, what are the other gold standards in the field? It's invasive angiography, it's invasive fractional flow reserve, it's an intravascular ultrasound and near infrared spectroscopy. And so after a developmental process of of, of seeing uh, how can you create a model of segmentation? How do you create a model of uh, coronary uh, stenosis evaluation? We then tested it in a multi-center trial against expert readers. Um, and this was to see how could AI guidance of uh, CT coronary imaging uh, compare to expert readers for stenosis assessment. Um, and the basic idea of how this works so that we can get into the idea of the black box is what's shown here. And so, um, the way that uh, the AI, it takes uh, images that are uploaded to a cloud-based server, uh, automatically uh, goes through the images to pick what is the best series for image quality among those uh, set of images, and then does automated coronary segmentation to pick out you know, what's coronary, what's not coronary, um, automatically labels uh, the, each of the aspects of the coronary tree, so whether it's LAD, circumflex, or right coronary artery, um, then uh, uh, picks out individual segments, you know, prox, mid, and distal LAD, uh, and then to be able to pick out, all right, uh, what's the level of stenosis in each of those segments? What's the type of plaque that's uh, present in each of those segments? And it uses a series of convolutional neural networks or, you know, uh, uh, UNET and BCG network to be able to give uh, the output. Um, just so that you know about the validation from over a million images from 23,000 vessels and 3,600 patients, the lumen vessel wall algorithms were from a million, uh, 1.4 million images from 8,500 vessels and 3,600 patients. Um, and 
to make this now palatable to you and I as clinicians. Um, uh, presented as a graphical output, and again, note, I do have a, a very small CI, COI here, um, but uh, what uh, this does is an, it tells us through this graphical interface, right, is there stenosis that's present in, each, in any of the coronary vessels? What's the amount of atherosclerotic plaque that's present on a level of millimeters cubed? Um, and are there high-risk plaque features? Um, the, uh, when you think about this process, and Right, the question of, uh, is this a problem that we need solving? Is this something that we can do well? Uh, the process of doing coronary segmentation using semi-quantitative methods um, that belie a lot of the papers that are in JAK imaging uh, takes hours to do, maybe even six to eight hours to be able to do, and is not available in clinical practice. And the goal with this is to be able to present, is to be able to uh, bring this to a, a clinician. The average analysis time is about 10 minutes. The FDA mandates that there is a human level review for any kind of AI product. And so I'm told it's about 10 to 25 minutes to be able to do this. Uh, what we found was that the accuracy of AI about 95 to 99% accurate on a per patient and per and on a per vessel basis when you compare it to level three expert consensus. Um, we sought to look against a QCA standard, so CATH and FFR. And so this is a multi-center study of the Credence trial an NHLBI funded uh, study. And again, uh, big kudos to uh, uh, really the Credence uh, authors um, uh, led by Jim Min and many others uh, that had put this together, Leslie Shaw. And what, uh, what uh, we sought to do is to see how does AIQCT compare um, against an invasive angiography standard as well as invasive FFR. Uh, we found is that the AUC is on a per patient uh, basis for 50% stenosis and 70% stenosis. The established standards of the field were accurate uh, and were similar to QCA um, and also similar against an invasive FFR standard. Now, interestingly, in the cases, uh, cases of this discordance, there was about a 10% atheroma volume when the AIQCT, so the AICT, didn't agree with invasive FFR, there was still significant plaque burden in many of those cases. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, Ed Nickel, uh, a great colleague, uh, wrote the editorial for this in Jack Imaging, uh, and he made a comment in there that says that you know, does a study make a slight mockery? So my apologies to the interventional colleagues in here of invasive angiography or QCA as a gold standard because maybe it doesn't pick up on plaque in the same way that this does, and that you know, some of our gold standards are imperfect, and uh, we do rely on uh, kind of a multi-parametric uh, approach uh, to thinking about this. We found that AICT was accurate over stress perfusion as well against a QCA and FFR standard, uh, predominantly spec imaging here as well. And so um, just to summarize this work, um, the last uh, really five years now, AIQCT highly accurate versus level three consensus um, and against QC and FFR, uh, more accurate than stress perfusion, allows for a wide range of atherosclerosis evaluation and is rapidly done. Um, uh, second take home point uh, is the evaluation of quantitative atherosclerosis over a billion pixels a day to apply in clinical practice. And so uh, let me take this from some of the theoretical things in the trials to uh, a patient. And so this is a patient from our institution at GW, a 50-year-old man who had presented with shortness of breath, hyperlipidemia, positive family history of CED, and a smoker. And so on the left is a CT image um, based on the level three consensus read. Um, what do you see? Um, just so that um, you know, we're in, in person. So what do you see on the left here in the corners? Yep. So there's some spotty calcification that's here. And no obstructive CAD, right? So what you're seeing is a you know pretty bland uh, coronary by uh, by the naked eye is that there's kind of minimal stenosis here. So you know on the screen projection, um, there's a little bit of plaque that's present, a little bit of calcified plaque, but really um, unremarkable. Uh, well, if you look in the middle image and you apply AI to it and do a plaque quantification um, and the standards and the thresholds are based on established standards in the field. The plaque volume here is quite high, 550 millimeters cubed. And so even with this patient with kind of minimal stenosis, there is a high plaque volume that's present and there's low density plaque um, that we've, uh, we've seen in other studies, and I'll show in a minute, that are at risk for 
uh, uh, kind of uh, intermediate or long-term risk of plaque rupture. And I'll talk about what this, you know, what these thresholds means in a minute. So you know, what do we do about this patient? And you know, what are the implications? Well, why are we here, right? Why, you know, why, you know, why did you go into cardiology? Why did I go into cardiology? It's to prevent heart attacks and to treat heart disease. We've known for the last several decades from uh, multiple studies, um, and more recently from uh, CT-based trials called ICONIC, the PROMISE trials we talked about in the Western Denmark uh, 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 registry, two-thirds of cardiac events are happening in patients without obstructive stenosis. Um, and these are the ones that we have the hardest time in identifying. Um, here's the most recent, really interesting data. So on the left is the Miami Heart Trial. And what Miami Heart was a very diverse cohort, 2,500 patients, um, much like that here in Northern New Jersey. 50% were Hispanic and Latino, 40% Latino, were non-Hispanic white. The mean age was 53 years old and 50% were women. Um, and among this uh, group, there were 50% of patients this is again a uh, population, asymptomatic patients, half the patients had uh, demonstrable plaque. On the right from Sweden, this is 20,000 patients uh, from Scapus and published in circulation. 42% of patients had demonstrable atherosclerosis. Uh, about five to 7% of the time they had severe CAD and 16% of the patients had a calcium score zero in the Miami Heart trial. So, are we missing a lot of patients that are walking, you know, I don't know, we can think about, you know, half the people in this room, um, you know, maybe have uh, CAD and we don't realize or we don't know it because we haven't had the best tools to be able to detect it, especially at younger, uh, at younger ages. We've known, we have, again, the underlying evidence for the ACC HHS pain uh, guidelines or multiple randomized trials in SCO. The Scott Hart trial, you know well, um, uh, randomized uh, uh, stable chest pain patients to uh, standard of care stress testing versus standard care plus CTA. So 40% relative risk reduction in MI and uh, coronary death over five years. The promised diabetes, a sub-study looking at the diabetic patients only, significant reduction in CV death and MI in diabetic patients. And on the right, um, published this past year, uh, the discharge trial, Mark Dewey and colleagues in Europe, about 30 centers, just randomizing patients that you would be sending to the cath lab with chest pain, but randomizing them to CT instead. And it's a follow-up on um, uh, uh, Jim Min's study from earlier, but just uh, larger, but published in the New England Journal. CT reduced major complications, fewer vascularization, similar MACE versus invasive cath, and probably because you're doing uh, just not doing the invasive procedure. We, we learned from the Scott Hart trial from Michelle Williams and um, post hoc analysis that plaque burden best predicts events, and it's independent of risk score, coronary artery, uh, uh, calcium scoring, and stenosis. Um, but to be able to do the plaque burden here um, in, in their methodology um, uh, was a research tool and wasn't something available in clinical practice. And so the next era of imaging will incorporate this image, uh, this information from quantitative plaque to facilitate individual patient management and improve outcomes. Um, when we think about plaque on a very nuanced basis, um, I think, uh, you know, one way to think about it, is it calcified, right? Is it calcified plaque? Is it non-calcified plaque? And what we've learned is that the calcified plaque is actually the more stable plaque. Um, and when you're looking at a calcium score, maybe a calcium score is more of a plaque biomarker rather than the plaque that's prone to rupture. And what this figure is showing you is that um, what Alex van Rosendahl in the Netherlands very cleverly uh, showed through uh, JAMA cardiology, and they coined it 1K plaque, is that the calcified dense plaque over 1,000 Hounsfeld units, which they called 1K plaque, was uh, lower risk and stable and not prone to rupture. Um, whereas Jagged Marula, um, you know, Moto Yoba you know, 15 years ago with the early papers looking at this, is that those patients that have a necrotic core, Hounsfeld unit less than 30, um, are the ones that are higher risk or the plaques that are prone to rupture. Um, and this is uh, the data from Iconic, which looked at, it was a case control study, but looking at patients from the 25,000 patient confirmed registry and then going back and seeing who are the ones that had MI. And that the necrotic core patients are the ones that were uh, uh, more likely to have a heart attack, whereas having the calcified plaque was more protective. And so the spectrum of uh, atherosclerotic risk uh, when we think about CAD, right, our paradigm, and you know, as a clinician, I think about, you know, sometimes it's simple, and I think about it this way as well. 
you know, does my patient have, you know, 70% stenosis or not? Um, but CT allows us to really identify a really broad range of atherosclerosis, not only stenosis, but plaque burden, location length, cocentricity, eccentricity, direction, diffusive composition, necrotic core, remodeling, morphology. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, right? This is, a, you know, if you're a fellow, right, like uh, make your slides simpler. Um, is it realistic for a human to be able to evaluate all of this stuff on a on a day to day basis, um, right? If you're in the um, right, if you're in the echo lab, right? Let me add, this is maybe um, we'll take this uh, just to kind of day to day. So um, for your ejection fractions, right? Do you do you guys do a visual visual estimation or do you do uh, you know three D quantitation or what? How do you guys do it? You do biplane, all right? Biplane, right? Biplane imaging, right? That's that's fair um, because it's uh, simple to it's simple to do. Um, and you have reproducibility to do that. And, and part of the reason is you're busy, right? You have to get through 30 to 50 echoes a day. And so you're trying to find the methodology that works best. And so, right, the quantitative tools are nice to have, but they are more time consuming. And this is where the why, you know, why does this matter? And if you're trying to do quantitative atherosclerosis, it is not realistic for a person or a human to be able to do this. And so, um, you know, kind of going back to where we uh, kind of started with this, the average imaging specialist, it's been estimated that um, if you're a reader, you may have to do over a billion pixels a day. You know that, you know, one uh, global healthcare data is now 2,300 exabytes. One exabyte is 1 billion gigabytes. And to record an exabyte video call would take you 237,000 years to be able to do that. And five exabytes are all the words that have been ever spoken by humans. And so the amount of data that even on a scan you have to process is tremendous. Now, how do you apply this across a patient? There are other methods. Um, this is from Michelle Williams again, um, multiple merging methods to atherosclerosis quantification. And so I really want to make sure we point out there are multiple methods of varying levels of validation. Um, and again, uh, plaque quantification is one of the outputs here. And so what we found through our study is first, AI could identify a wide range of atherosclerosis. And then we've been now trying to figure out what does this mean? Um, we find that there is good accuracy against the invasive standards, so near uh, field infrared spectroscopy and IBIS, and this is data from Japan, uh, where they do a ton of uh, invasive ultrasound and um, have been a, a really wonderful collaborator. Um, and uh, at SECT last year, showing that um, quantitative, quantitative plaque burden and uh, through a novel plaque staging system that's been proposed, you know, that may be mild 0 to 250, moderate 250 to 750 millimeters cubed and more than 750 millimeters cubed will help us prognosticate. And um, we have uh, uh, upcoming, um, hopefully we'll see it out, it's 10-year uh, outcomes data with, um, we have uh, my research fellow from the Netherlands has been looking at this showing that uh, AI-guided uh, plaque quantification being superior to clinical methods, superior to clinical calcium scoring, and even better um, than what's set up in CADRADS 2.0 um, with a, seg a segment involvement score. And so um, I, I think uh, this, hopefully, uh, it's under review right now uh, at, uh, at uh, one of the uh, major journals. Uh, we'll see this uh, in, in publication really help to show you and show the field uh, where this field is going. Uh, Domini Day and colleagues in Cedar sinai doing really outstanding work in multiple domains by uh, using deep learning CTA, also showing important accuracy versus intravascular ultrasound and finding very similar plaque volume thresholds. That, you know, here they had 240 millimeters cubed being predictive of events, um, both uh, for that and also for stenosis. And that was in Lancet. Um, uh, radiomics, I know the work here on radiomics and echocardiography. Um, is, is um, an area of interest. And there's also been radiomics from um, Mrs. Palmarovich uh, and colleagues um, looking at radiomics uh, phenotyping, really trying to break that image down uh, into um, uh, really uh, the radiomic level to be able to uh, segment out the plaque and to be able to predict, um, predict cardiovascular events. So um, now why is this, again, so a lot of technical aspects, you know, you, you may not be imagers. So, you know, how does this apply to me as a clinician? How do we use AI to advance new frontiers in precise, individualized risk prediction and prevention? Let me give you another case. This is, this is my patient, 55-year-old man with hyperlipidemia, presenting with acute chest pain, with walking, active lifestyle, jogs, lifts weights. So you know, probably very much like a patient that you'd be seeing here in Northern New Jersey, um, had actually very well-controlled cholesterol, but had a stress echocardiogram 
uh, that was normal one year prior. And so this is what the CT had shown. And so um, on the left here, uh, moderate grade LAD stenosis, so in the red, um, with a non-calcified plaque that's present, and the 3D here is showing that as well. On the right, severe RCA stenosis. Um, this RCA was intervened on uh, because it was thought to be the cause of the symptoms, but what to do about this moderate LAD stenosis? And this is right at the time the ischemia trial had come out too. And so you know, it was really a kind of a, a multiple layer question of what to do about it. Um, and I think some, I don't know, how many, how many folks would intervene on a moderate uh, stenosis or do both? I guess your, your group is, uh, you know, is very, uh, uh, you do FFR, all right, that's fair, right? Do an FFR on it and decide whether to intervene on. You know, probably you know, the answer 15 years ago is that, you know, or 20 years ago is intervene on, right? Because that was, that was what the field said, is that anything over 50%, you stent it, and that was dogma. Um, well, we decided to leave it alone, um, and it's also a reminder here of the CT. Normal stress test does not mean the absence of coronary disease, as was the case in this patient. So he got his CT scan. Um, what he did was he changed his lifestyle because of what he had seen. So uh, vegan lifestyle, he started exercising more uh, rigorously, 45 minutes a day. He initiated lipid lowering therapy. Um, and uh, I want to come back to this uh, idea um, because you know, this is where the plaque is going to be very, uh, is, is uh, so powerful for us. Um, plaque has a sex specific signature in women. And how do we really personalize things for patients? And um, you know, if we can identify a quantitative plaque or low attenuation plaque, and that may be how, how we differentiate between men and women. Um, the evaporate trial, you know, this is a trial of, of much discussion with my uh, good friend and colleague, Matt Budoff uh, and, and others. And so the use of icosapen ethyl uh, for these patients that have high triglycerides and the progression of atherosclerosis. And so what they found was that, um, that if you gave icosapen ethyl, you could have a significant reduction in quantified low attenuation plaque volume on CT, and it provided an important linkage of cardiovascular events to, Im to an imaging phenotype. Again, uh, what they used was um, semi-quantitative methods in Metis. Um, it was a small number of patients because they didn't, at the time, they didn't have the technology available to apply this on a more, on a more broad basis. But what uh, Evaporate does is start to provide a scaffolding to uh, helping patients and also studying new drugs. When you think of, again, the preventative drugs, what do we have available in our armamentarium around prevention? This is what I'm excited about these days. Um, and the field of prevention over the next decade is this, right? How do we apply? So statins, icosamine, ethyl, P69, lifestyle, colchicine, NOAX, and how do we really uh, incorporate that with imaging? And so, um, you know, really for the clinicians, this is the thing, this is a slide to really take away is where, where is this AI going to help us? Uh, not only risk prediction here for major adverse cardiovascular events, but predicting those that are going to progress rapidly, predicting those patients that are going to respond. So how many of you have had a patient that was on statin, but still broke through and had the heart attack? Right, and why did that happen? Was it that you know maybe it's that you think, and which I, I'm I'm with this. Maybe you were missing their LP little a um, that was elevated that just wasn't checked before. You know uh, when horizons come out, you know maybe we'll get a, a better treatment around LP little a. Um, you know I, I sometimes I use LDL particle concentration uh, just because I was trained in that 20 years ago. Um, so you know there is some role for biomarkers here, but also direct phenotyping I think is how we can do better individualized prevention. Benefit from inv invasive uh, uh, catheterization, uh, ischemia prediction, um, and on the right are you know how we can start to really look at plaque regression, right? Um, this is a kind of interesting question. How many you know have you had a patient at ask right? If I take my drug therapy, take my statin, is my plaque going to actually get better? You know, it, you know, is it going to actually get better on the inside? And I have like every patient that I see in my in in my clinic. Um, um, is asking that question, is it going to actually get, is it going to get better? Um, and so, you know, a lot of the new drugs that are coming down the pipeline are also asking that question. Um, and we need um, to be able to study this in large trials. We need imaging, um, unless we're going to you know, devote, you know, money that we don't have billions of dollars into um, just hard outcomes. We have to uh, do these trials first to be able to uh, predict what the response is so that we can apply this more broadly. And it, uh, you know, I think AI uh, guided CTA is 
going to be what wins out, but it's not the only method, you know, MRI, OCT, you know, you know Steve Nissen did asteroid 20 years ago using uh, intravascular ultrasound and rosuvastatin, right? IBIS is very hard to do. Um, you know, patients don't like getting it because it's invasive and it's expensive to do. So, um, you know, while it is a gold standard, it is hard to do it on a larger scale. Let's see, some chat questions, or CME. All right, so going back to this patient, um, he had AIQCT applied. Um, and we have this because we're a um, developmental site um, for this, but we applied it uh, to the patient. We told him what, what, what and why we were doing. Uh, with his LDL in the 50s, over two years of follow-up. Um, so what are you seeing on the left uh, versus the right? And, and what has happened to that plaque? Right, so if you look at the color, you know, color coding kind of helps you with that in the you know, stenosis, right? So what you're seeing is that there is uh, the demonstrable regression in the plaque. And also, you know, what you're pointing out really smartly is that there's some plaque stabilization that's taken place. Um, and so uh, using AIQCT, now we can put numbers on this. So 40% plaque regression in non-calcified plaque and a reduction in stenosis from 68% to 31% stenosis. And because we've Test it. You know, we can be uh, assured that this uh, these numbers are are accurate. Uh, and so, uh, plaque stabilization. There's an increase in the calcified plaque, which is probably indicative of a statin treatment. And there's plaque regression of all the non-calcified plaque components that we quantified about 40% non-calcified plaque regression. And so, you know, I showed this to this patient, and well, he was uh, overjoyed to hear that his. Uh, not only his lifestyle modifications, which are the foundation for everything we do with prevention, but also his drug therapy had had this kind of effect. Um, and, um, you know, it really gave not only uh, kind of important feedback to him, but also really proof of proof of concept. And so um, now, uh, any, let me stop there for a, a moment before I get to this last uh, part. Any questions? Because that's this idea of, I think, prevention, incorporating atherosclerosis imaging, um, I think uh, is really what's most exciting about the next 10 years in the future. And I want to talk about some novel uh, technology. Right. Right. How much is the average of the regression you have seen people Yeah, so the question uh, from Dr. Sengupta is, what's the amount of plaque regression that has been seen? Um, and it's an open question right now. So um, one has to think about uh, how are you controlling for the different types of ways that you might be able to demonstrate regression. So are you going to uh, first study an LDL uh, patient population and look at uh, on treatment with changes in LDL? Are you going to look at you know, LP little a um, and see what the changes in regression are? And then can you also model um, what type of treatment that's been on? Because the um, some of the databases that um, that have this, um, you know, can tell you whether they've been on treatment or not, but they may not be able to model it. Um, I think in the patients where, um, so we've been asking, you know, asking these questions and, and working on uh, kind of some collaborations. We're also trying to figure out what's the right number to be able to to predict this and, and show this. And so, you know, maybe the meaningful endpoint is maybe five to at least five to ten percent uh, uh, regression if you have LDL lowering or LPA little a. Uh, lowering. Um, and that's what some of the data has been uh, showing us. Um, the question has to be answered also through a randomized control trial. So, uh, and some of this also goes back to image quality that even answer the questions in interscan variability. Because if I say it's 10% uh, regression, which is what some of what we've been seeing in some of this preliminary data, well, you might tell me, you know, maybe there's a 10% interest in variability that takes place from patient to patient. We have to adjust for that right now as well. So it's an open question that you're asking. Yep. 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 
Yeah, so the question is, all right, let's take the RCA out of it and just say you had moderate LAD stenosis uh, and you had a patient coming in with chest pain and you're trying to understand, all right, what's the right thing to do for this patient uh, based on the evidence? Say you apply an FFR, so we'll pick one, you know, either an invasive FFR or a CT FFR, and it tells you that it, the FFR value is negative, meaning that it's over 0.8, so it's a non-ischemic vessel, right? And how do you tell that patient that's going to be okay? Um, I think a couple of uh, ways to, uh, that I would answer that to you based on uh, evidence. Uh, one is that, well, we do have the ischemia trial, and so the ischemia trial took you know, 50, what, 5,000 patients and randomized them. After getting a CTA, they took out the 8% of patients with left main disease. Um, and then if you had moderate to severe ischemia, had uh, optimal medical therapy or invasive uh, testing. And so this patient would certainly could fall, although it doesn't have ischemia, so it doesn't quite even meet that criteria, right? Because you, you've said the FFRCT is negative. But, and so, but if you kind of extrapolate that, you'd say, well, you know, you do okay uh, with medications um, based, on, based on that data. I think the, the kind of fundamental question is going to come back to their symptoms, right? So is this the cause of their symptoms or not? And I think then you have to have an act one, one, do you have an accurate means of testing for ischemia? Brett, I'm going to show you some of the recent CTFFR data just published that um, adds a layer of, I think, challenge for this type of, type of lesion where it's like 69%. So it's a CTFFR even accurate um, in that in that range, and that's that's where I'm at right now, and I'll show you why uh, in just a minute. Um, and so I think it I think fundamentally it's it is based on uh, symptom uh, symptomatic benefit, not mortality benefit, right? They're not they're not going to live longer if you've but you might make them feel better. And then um, maybe you ask the question, you know, we were talking about, you know, microvasculature, uh, maybe that's where your PET imaging uh, uh, also fits into this paradigm. I don't know. What do you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The reason we are able to Yeah, so uh, advocacy issues uh, underlie all of this, um, right? And this goes back to 20 years ago when uh, when CT came about and where um, CT was put into the uh, cost center at CMS. It was put in a cost center. It didn't quite make sense. And so the reimbursements have been too low. Um, other imaging modalities had, have been much more, I think, successful in that realm. Um, there is a level three code that uh, now uh, is has been created around plaque quantification. Um, just as there one, uh, the one for flow, a uh, coronary flow is right now being debated as a level one code. Um, my prediction is that the level three code will be uh, moved up to a level one code before too long. Uh, and uh, now the cost. Now, now you have to think about cost. So. Um, cost of a, a general CTA, uh, you know, speaking as an academic, right, um, and being as neutral and fair to what the reality is possible. So, you know, I, I say $200, right, is what the reimbursement is for CMS for CTA, um, where uh, the pricing is set for flow and for plaque quantification are each at $950. Um, and they were set um, uh, uh, based on one another. Now, um, the uh, I think industry is taking a different kind of nuanced view um, uh, of that. And uh, I think the ones that will be successful will be the ones that are the most collaborative with their sites, and we'll, we'll leave it at that. But the question is not only a cost, it's not the upfront cost is what matters, it's the downstream value um, that you provide. And so um, can you, uh, will you be able to provide value to a healthcare system by reducing uh, excess testing and to be able to target the testing in a way of which you have the most benefit. And so, you know, maybe your health as a broad healthcare system, and Lee Health is one example. Um, Rick Chazal, who's past president of ACC, is the one that's been kind of pioneering this or thinking about this. So in a large healthcare system, maybe if you're preventing heart attacks and you know, you know, from an account about accountable care organization, you're presenting cost savings. And so government is happy um, and our patients are happy because we're helping uh, helping them to live fuller lives. Um, and by reducing the uh, 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 the less invasive testing, um, then maybe we also have uh, 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 cost savings to the healthcare system, and then we can um, really uh, kind of increase our preventative care. And so, 
I think it's not a cost question, it's a value question. And, you know, will this provide value? And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. What is your message? Yeah, so questions about coronary calcium scoring uh, with or without hyperlipidemia. Um, so I, I think there's a, it is an important role. So, uh, you know, to, uh, this is Roger Blumenthal, right, that put, you know, got this into the uh, blast prevention guideline. So for those patients that are at seven and a half, 20% ASCVD risk, um, do you uh, use casting score decision tool to uh, de-risk uh, de or not, especially if you have a casting score of zero? And so, Calcium scoring, I, I think, can be a high value proposition because it's an inexpensive test to be able to do. If you have a calcium score of zero, you can de-risk those patients. Um, the the uh, challenge with calcium scoring is that 15% of patients that are having heart attacks have a calcium score of zero, so it's missing uh, those patients. And the calcium score is probably more of a biomarker than the actual plaque that's that's uh, that's rupturing. Uh, and so, and calcium scoring may not work that well in the younger patients because younger patients don't have calcified plaque. It's really the older patients, the over 60, uh, 60 years old. So, you know, 30, 40, 50 year old patients um, where you're trying to really promote prevention in an earlier way, um, I, I don't think it's going to be the best approach because only a third of those patients have, have calcium scoring. Uh, and so, I think there's a role. I think it's a high value proposition, um, but I think it, um, it it's still missing a lot of patients that have disease, and that's the lessons from Miami Heart Escapist. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right. So, all right. So, it's three. No, so, three preventative questions that are uh, underlying there. One's about right prognostic value of a, a negative stress test or an exor, uh, negative, especially negative exercise treadmill test. So, right, negative stress test means that you're unlikely to have an event in one year. And the uh, chest pain guidelines author put they put a warranty period of one year on the stress test. So, I think that's true. Um, and would he have died, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, and so I think the maybe mortality is not the only endpoint to look at and the value of stress, exercise stress testing, I think as much as in the exercise capacity and the hemodynamics that you get out of that, as much as it is the, um, the risk prediction. Um, uh, the, I, what was the second one was, uh, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so pool cohort equations. So part of why um, calcium scoring gets into the prevention guidelines is that you know the pool cohort equations, even though they are um, multi-ethnic um, and, and you know multiple studies that go into it, they still overestimate risk significantly, um, and it means that you're going to overtreat. Um, you know, people have said. You know, if there's 60 million patients that um, should be treated with um, uh, statin therapy based on pool co cohort equations, there may be at least 10 to 15 million patients that are being unnecessarily treated. Uh, and so pool cohort equations, and they don't work as well also in younger patient populations, right? So then you have to think about lifetime risk score, but lifetime risk score has no validation, uh, validation behind it. So um, I think that's uh, when when we looked, you know, we did this just in our local population and trying to do, uh, you know, for the uh, trying to just see, you know, answer that question. Sixty percent of the patients that had an ASCVD risk under seven and a half percent had um, demonstrable atherosclerosis and plaque, and maybe they should be treated. And so, to us, that was a big number of, of patients that we were missing. Also, so it goes both ways: overestimation and underestimation of risk. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, I, I think of the CERT trial, you know, CIRT. I don't know if you guys participated in the CERT trial. We were we were part of it too, and um, you know, it didn't go so well, right? You know, it stopped early because of so. You know, there is certainly infl you know, in inflammation, and um, you know, my colleagues uh, that are in this space, and you know, Paul Ricker is a genius, uh, right? Uh, I think um, have pointed. You know, there is inflammation, but is it specific enough to be able to answer uh, questions and? Um, yeah, I mean, some of the, um, even a drug like methotrexate or um, even the novel anti-inflammatory agents, the absolute risk reduction of like, it's pretty expensive, um, you know, to identify a patient just based on inflammation alone that uh, for a drug therapy and, um, you know, it's the uh, inflammatory marker is very nonspecific. Um, I think there's a value in, you know, if, right, this is like, we're talking about the next 10 years, right? And so if you're thinking about like, what, what's the simplest thing I can do in my clinic today for a 45 year old where I'm trying to risk stratify them? I, I think it's reasonable to just do, you know, to do a CRP because you have to do what you have available to you and what you have access to. So, All right, uh, let me uh, wrap up uh, this because I know we're past, uh, past time here. I, I just wanted to answer this question around, um, you know, CT and CTFFR. And so CTFFR allows us to combine coronary anatomy and flow through computational fluid dynamics. Uh, I was thinking about it a decade ago, um, and many, many, many others have been thinking it much more deeply. And so can we predict what's happening at the distal coronary? Um, this is data just published in Jack Imaging a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 12 centers from the United Kingdom, uh, Mittal, uh, Kalyan, Ed Nickel, who uh, will be uh, president of SECT soon, um, uh, looking at those patients that were referred for CTFFR, um, some of the accuracy data depends on the rejection rate. 40% uh, of the patients in moderate stenosis, but the positive predictive value is only 49%. And the cost of CTFFR was 40% higher than SPECT and 24% higher than stress CMR. Uh, and this is in, uh, in the UK and NHS. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I've uh, been very enthusiastic. It's in the guidelines. There is a ton of um, um, pros to CTFFR, you can avoid layer testing. There's excellent prognosis with a negative CTFFR in the trial environment. And maybe more as a continuous variable, so not using 0.8 as a cutoff, but maybe 0.75 to 0.8 gives you the continuum of risk. And it's a 2A in the guidelines for 40 to 90% stenosis. But there are important questions. And um, you know, what are the outcomes impact in the real world? What's the accuracy in the real world? There is high cost uh, to this. And uh, maybe it's only applied for about 10% of cases. And so this will be on Jack Imaging in a couple of weeks. And where I think uh, CTFFR will fall is, you know, you know, how do we think about just CAD imaging now? Well, maybe we leverage the class 1A evidence in CTA uh, for intermediate risk stable chest pain. We focus on image quality. We exclude high-risk anatomy. And that there's a new CAD image triple aim. So we can do stenosis, plaque quantification, and we refine our ischemia testing and not to forget about the microvasculature. And so um, where the field is going, functioning significant plaque, and so how we use uh, AI to be able to determine uh, uh, ischemia or function significant CAD. This is from Korea um, and something that we uh, presented at ACC, um, uh, doing a model of feature extraction and model prediction using uh, based on the CT imaging. Um, 37 uh, uh, parts of this uh, algorithm to predict ischemia or no ischemia. We did internal external validation with Credence and Pacific. Pacific uh, trial data was presented at ACC. The credence part of this is going to be a late breaker at EACBI in a couple of weeks from Alex Van Rosendahl, but showing that this AI QCT ischemia tool, so using a CT, using 37 plaque parameters of which stenosis and plaque diffuseness were among, uh, stenosis is still the most important factor, but also plaque diffuseness um, was uh, just as accurate as PET imaging, as is water PET. Uh, and uh, uh, FFRCT, and at least in this cohort, uh, in predicting ischemia. Um, and this is um, what it uh, what it looks like in its clinical form, but uh, point out not FDA approved uh, yet. Um, uh, other approaches, non-invasive FFR estimation using histologically validated quantitative plaque assessment, also showing high accuracy, and this is courtesy of Todd Malines. And so I think this is where the field is going. And so just on a clinical basis, um, you know, what should we do? Do CT first, we get stenosis, plaque burden, and quantitation. Make sure we get our patients in goal-directed medical therapy, and then maybe you apply this any of these ischemia assessment tools for about 10 to 15% per guidelines. 
um, by ACC guidelines for those patients with 40 to 90 percent stenosis, and by CADRADS 2.0, which is an SECT multi-society uh, document of 50 to 90 percent. And image quality is key, and there are new approaches that will help us determine functionally uh, functional approaches to CAD. And so, uh, last point. Um, uh, Dr. Sengupta, uh, this prime checklist that underlies every paper that goes to Jack Imaging. Um, if you want to do something new in AI and imaging, it has to pass this prime checklist test for data standardization, model assessment, and rep rep replicability. Um, AI and CT is very much uh, part of prevention, but we do have to validate this. Uh, some of the future studies include the WISDOM trial and trans uh, confirmed to um, which will uh, uh, look at a large registry of about, uh, about 40 sites right now that are participating uh, with long-term follow-up subgroup analysis in this transform trial that will answer the question Dr. Sing Sengupta asked, what's the plaque regression that you're going to see with treatment and looking at different, uh, different groups of patients um, uh, with long-term outcomes so that maybe this is what will be part of the next 10 years of care and also the next uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, and then I think uh, something from ACC 2023 I thought was very interesting is around virtual clinical trials and how we use AI to do uh, the virtual trial itself. And again, uh, Partho is the expert in this area. So that by doing this, how do we make our lives easier? How do we act as a second reader? How do we uh, reduce the time spent on comprehensive assessment? And how do we translate the decades of evidence that we have available and, and, uh, and it, it improve our adherence to guidelines? And so, AI-guided CTA will prevent heart attacks through advanced identification of atherosclerosis, and I think the future is here. And so thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you very much. That was a very eloquent uh, lecture. I was sitting with uh, Andrew and discussing it. What happens there? And I was hearing that perhaps I was holding something. Uh, I mean, we all know what the black box phenomena are. And that's the question. Fuck me. Volume does. Fuck goes out without really approaching into the human, changing the blood flow reality inside. Now, and and uh, but imaging is going to be key in applying the right sets of tool and having that understanding through. So it's not also about the AI. I find the fun part is the rediscovering the whole physiology and yeah. understanding about cardiology. And many of the clinical trials are just based upon the assumptions. Yeah. Uh, and those assumptions may 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 not be valid. Yeah. So that is very exciting and really want to thank you, uh, Andrew, for the work that you for the entire crowd here for coming up. And I want to really also acknowledge some of our colleagues from internet technology because it's going to be a very nice um, uh, engaging action between uh, one bridge of prevention to how you intervene and when you intervene. It's going to be the future is going to be very exciting and it's going to be complex than we think it is going as we go into the complex environment using uh, uh perhaps we'll play some roles. Thank you everyone. All right, well said. So here's a question.